Hello, I'm Katherine Artinas. Thanks for joining me and welcome to this first video of 2017. Do any of your resolutions involve Perfect Embroidery Pro? Mine certainly do. In this short video, we'll be taking a look at the advanced features of pull and push compensation as they relate to distortion issues in your embroidery. Our goal is to understand what pull-push distortion is and to see how to set pull values as a possible solution. You have digitized a beautiful design. It looks perfect on screen. You printed a template, placed it on the project, hooped the fabric with the appropriate stabilizer based on the design, and you're even being good by stitching out a test sew. The first color looks good, the next does too, then the next and the next, and when it's finished, it's not quite as pictured on your screen. What happened? If you've been embroidering for a while, you know that many decisions are made for a successful stitch out. I just mentioned a number of them, using good quality fabric and embroidery thread for your project, using the appropriate stabilizer for the design, be it tearaway, cutaway, medium weight, lightweight, the correct size hoop, the proper speed on your machine, making sure it's hooped correctly, not too tight, not too loose. There's a lot to remember, but these things become second nature as you travel down your embroidery path. So for the purposes of this video, we're going to assume that all of these decisions are correct, and we will focus on the design itself. Specifically, gaps between areas of fill or registration that is off which could be caused by push-pull distortion. Now, I'm not saying that every time you have gaps in your embroidery areas or poor registration, you should immediately go change the push-pull numbers. In fact, I only do that once I've done a test stitch out and that type of distortion is there. Pull and push compensation are just other tools you have if you need them. Remember, PEP already does a number of things internally so that we don't always have to build from scratch. Two, be sure to make any changes to pull push in your native file, which is your C2S file. Changes made to a machine format file don't always work as expected. What we're going to do here is to see what push and pull are, how they work, and what the stitch out looks like when we change the defaults for areas of a design. Again, assuming everything else is correct, we'll take a look at push-pull distortion. What is push-pull? It is the stress and strain resulting from a number of stitches going in the same direction. Stitches going from side to side or across the width of a column, as you see here with pull. Also, it is the force that wants to push outward on the ends of an object, as you see here in the white, which is push. Pull distortion happens in every stitch. Just by the very nature of the procedure, the stitch is formed and it pulls tight, which means it's shortening slightly. The shrinking always occurs in the direction or angle of the stitches. Pull at the top. This is our stitch direction, so the shrinkage will occur here. Pull distortion happens to satin and fill stitch areas, not to run stitches. With a large number of stitches or with high speeds during embroidery, distortion could occur in the shapes or areas causing outlines to not land or stitch where they should, and sometimes leaving gaps between neighboring areas. We see that happening here in this purple star. There is always some drag on your fabric during the embroidery process as the hoop moves and the needle penetrates the fabric. A number of factors come into play that causes this drag. Let's take a closer look at one of the free designs we're given with PEP. On a clean screen, we're going to come over to the library, find our perfect Embroidery Pro free designs. We'll click on that. I'll come down into the display area, right click, choose Show Contents. It'll bring me into that folder with all of the free designs. We'll go ahead and double click on this 7391 boot. I'll use my zoom, come over to the side, and I'm really going to zoom in here so, so you can see what we're talking about. The word compensation means to adjust or offset, and that's what we're doing when we add pull compensation. We're adjusting where the needle penetrations or the stitch points 
land. Because the threads pull in from the stitch points, we usually adjust so that they land a bit outside the object area. Can you see the stitch points extending past the area edge? We're talking about these points right here. And this was digitized with this adjustment. Again, pull happens on the sides of the stitch points. Let's use our pan hand to scoot up to the top of this boot so that we can see an area that has been created by the digitizer to accept the push distortion. Push distortion happens when stitches that are laid close together try to push each other apart in order to lie flat in a single layer. You'd want to bring in those areas or make them shorter, not as wide, to stop the stitching just shy of where we actually would like them to be. And if you look right here in this area, see that little bit of white that doesn't have any stitches in the background? Or here on the right side, again, this white area that doesn't have any stitches? Let's go ahead and zoom in just once more so that we can see we're actually looking at this group of stitches in the gray. And as we look at the extreme right, we can see the stitch ends or the stitch points where the needle penetrates off to the sides of this area. So here at the top, we have the flat area where the stitches go across. And this then is the push area. Push happens at the opposite sides of our pull or our stitch ends. So right here, the digitizer has left a little bit of area for when this particular area stitches, we'll have some of that stitch pushed out just a little bit and we have a nice gap to accept that bulging of those stitches. All types of stitches create the push-pull effect, but it is most prominent when you're using the satin path or a complex fill stitch and also again when stitching in a large area. Remember, pull-push is just another tool that we have. Other options for making adjustments are varying the stitch direction, amount of understitch, the stitch density. We have many tools in our basket. With all of this being said about shrinkage with our pull distortion, we need to also understand that too much overlapping can mean lumpy or thick areas, which is really just as bad as gaps. Let's play a little more to see what actually happens in our designs. Back into PEP, we'll come into a clean screen. And I'm going to draw three circles on the screen using the artwork. Use my ellipse tool, and I'll go ahead and hold down my control key so that they are relatively perfect. And I'll do a small, medium, and large. Go ahead and zoom so that we can see them. I will also come over to Sequence, select them all, and do a little bit of alignment so that they're nice to look at. Again, I'll select all three, right click, convert to complex fill, and then just so that we can talk about them easily, I'll change the second one to red and the third one to green. Small, medium, and large. Let's watch to see how these are going to stitch out. We'll come up here to our slow redraw and move my speed a little faster. I'll go ahead and click on the simulate button. And as we watch them, we can see the underlay where it starts in this particular small circle. The stitching itself starts all the way over at the right and does in one motion to the left here in the medium circle. It starts top to bottom and then bottom to top for the underlay. Again, the stitching itself starts over at the right and it's going to stitch as we see it. And certainly we could go up and drag our bar if I wanted to just keep going and watch all that stitching here with my large. Underlay starts at the bottom to the middle, goes from the top to the middle and the stitching will be slightly different also. We'll notice that we have a little bit of it stitched over at the right. It goes over and stitches a little at the left and then comes back over to do most of the stitching. 
Again, I can click on that bar and move at a faster pace to see how that will finish stitching. So this is to show you that size does matter as far as the way that the design will stitch out. But also, we want to take a look at the start and stop buttons. I'll click on shapes, and as we have just played with the green, we see that the points are in the four positions of our circle. But here we have the stop on the left, the start at the right, and you can see the placement of those. We also see the direction of the stitch with our yellow angle line. If I click on the red circle, I see my stop and starts in the same position as I did in my green. And two with the blue, they are in the same position. If I come back to the green, because it's larger and easier for you to see, and I change where those stop and starts are, it's going to change the way that the circle is going to stitch out. So let me grab the stop and I'll drag it to the bottom, then drag the green start all the way to the top. We've made that change. I'll come over and click on apply. We'll go back into our slow redraw. I'll skip our blue and red quickly. And now let's take a look at the green. Again, it starts at the bottom for the underlay goes then up to all the way to the top, so we've altered that as well. Starts over at the left and stitches, and we'll go ahead and grab that bar again to move this through, and we can see that because we changed the stop and start, those two are going to meet in the middle. So by doing this, you might begin to understand a little bit more when you see embroidery stitch out how something is created and why that happens that way. Let's go back to our slides, take a look at this next one. We want to make sure that we're comfortable with the idea of stitch direction. As you see here, your stitch points go in the same line as the stitch direction. Here this is the realistic view where our threads are in there. Here we have just our plain view. The stitch points are at the top and the bottom. Therefore the direction, the stitch direction, it goes from top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom, or perhaps bottom to top, depending on what the start stop buttons are positioned. So at this point we understand stitch direction. Stitch direction and sewing direction are really two different things. Sewing direction is not necessarily the same as the angle of stitch. If we look at these circles, here we have our stitch direction, meaning that is the angle of the stitches. Our stitch points go from side to side, yet the sewing direction is going to go from top to bottom. We have our start at the top and our stop at the bottom. Here's another slide where we can see all of this in a little bit more slow motion stops uh, action type of slide. Depending on the stitch direction or the angle that you have set, this could alter the stitch out pattern. If we have our stitch direction going vertically and our stop and starts are on the sides, it is going to start, this is the starting point for the underlay. So we start here, go up to the top, and here we have our stitch direction, and it then comes to the sides where it's going to fill in all of our stitch direction over to the side. If we change that angle, see how your yellow line here is vertical, if we take a look here and the yellow line has been rotated just a bit on the diagonal, so the stitch direction has been changed, see how that alters the stitch out of your circle. The start point is still here on the right, so that starting point will begin right there with your underlay, and it comes and begins that, noticing that it is now stitching in the direction, the angle that we have set. And in this instance, it is going to come and fill this top side first and then come over and fill this bottom side. 
if we go to the bottom circle, we make the stitch direction horizontal. The start is at the top, stop is at the bottom. Your start position is here. It goes through all of the underlay and then it fills the circle from the top to the bottom. You can see again from this chart that the stitch direction, the angle, which is indicated by the yellow lines right here, alters the stitch out pattern. And you can see how the underlay has been altered and where it starts and then how the circle itself fills out and finishes. We go back to PEP and we'll take a look at that green circle. Even though we played with this to see the stitch out and how altering the stop starts alters our play out of the stitching, let's go ahead and change those back. Here we have the stop and start running in the same area as the sewing direction. So we would want to change those and put those back to where they were so that we have a better situation in our circle. Once again, if we take a look at the changes we just made, we'll go ahead and scoot through that blue and red and we take a look at our green and it's going to fill up all the way across. Have you ever stitched a circle where you have a missing row in the middle? If this has happened to you where you're stitching out a circle and it acts very much like we just saw on the PEP screen where half of the circle stitches out and then the other comes to the middle. As you see here, this is the actual stitch out, whereas here's the drawing of that stitch out. This usually happens because half of the design area was sewn from the outside to the center and then the other half is stitched from side to center. As it does this, a small area of fabric can be pushed towards the middle you might not even see the fabric bulge or bubble up, but that's what causes this gap in stitching. Let's go into PEP and we will open a design I already have started for us. And in here, we would have that middle gap. Let's take a look first at this circle, how it was drawn. And we see here our start position and our stop position. Actually, this angle is in the same direction as our stitch points. If we watch this play out, I'll go ahead and grab the bar and play it out on our own speed. We see the entire underlay stitches from bottom to top. And then as we move through, it starts at the left, goes to the center, starts at the right, goes to the center. And that could be what causes that gap in the circle. If this is a purchase design, you may be out of luck as far as fixing the design, perhaps using a fusible stabilizer or spray on a cutaway stabilizer may help. But if you digitize this and you have your native C2S design, as you see right down here, this hasn't been saved as a machine format. I can go in and change those stop start positions so that they are opposite from each other. We know that this is the preferred method. If I take that green start and I move it to the left, move my red to the right, I'll go ahead and do an apply. Let's do that slow redraw again. And here we have the underlay broken into two sections. And here we see the circle going from left to right, all stitched out in one circle. So that could help you with those areas that have that little bit of gap in the middle. Let's talk some more about some shapes. We will go ahead and open another design that I have created for us. And this is rectangles as you see them. In this design, all the rectangles are the same size and they all have the original stitch direction except for the green one at the top. Here, this is the original rectangle artwork and I uh, copy pasted it and did a complex fill and left the pull and push distortions where they're going to happen. Remember that pull happens at the areas or the sides of your stitch ends and push happens on the opposite. The push is where you have a little bit of bulge. 
the pull is where you have a little bit of shrinking. If we were to create a rectangle, as we have done here with no changes in default at all, when this stitches out, we are going to expect that the left rectangle will be shorter and fatter when stitched out, and the right rectangle, the green one, will be taller and skinnier when stitched. We base that assumption on the direction of the stitch ends versus the flat ends. We'll take a look at our slide, and we see in this next one where I actually have taken that design on screen and stitched these out for you. Remember, the way the design looks on the screen is not how it will stitch out. Here is the picture of the design on screen, and they look even. But if we go to stitch them out, this is the look that I have. We take a ruler and we measure the artwork, the original artwork that is simply a run stitch. It is one inch wide, as this original was. If we then measure the second rectangle, it too is one inch. And then if we measure the third rectangle, we see that it is shorter than that. Now, here again, I've given you the uh, picture as a reference. In this first one, our push has occurred, and we didn't get that much push that this width extends farther out than the one inch. However, on the third rectangle, which had the directions changed, the stitch ends are on the sides, we did get the pull effect. And you can see right here that this third rectangle is about a sixteenth of an inch smaller than the original and the first rectangle. If we are talking about the height, again, with the pull on the second triangle and the push at the second triangle. So we expect the second one to be shorter and this one to be slightly taller. If we do our measurement, again, here's our ruler. The original is exactly two inches, but yet if we measure the second rectangle, we see that it's about an eighth inch shorter than the original. And if I lay that ruler out so that you can see all of them, here we do have a bit of push happening, that little bit of bulging or pushing out, whereas we definitely see the shrinkage from the pull. So this is a good example of seeing how pull and push work when you have three things that are exact same size on your software screen. And again, what we see on screen is not necessarily what we get in our stitch out. If we go back into that design, let's play a little bit more here to see if we knew that this was going to happen or we saw that it did happen from our test stitch out. How do we go about dealing with the pull and the push on these sides? I'm going to take this red rectangle. All of these lower rectangles are the same design. It is this first one with the pull at the top and the bottom. We'll take that one, come over here to our properties, come to our pull push, and here we see the screen for the first time. What do we do to change or anticipate this distortion? We'll play first with the pull. By default, it's set to none. We'll go ahead and click on that and choose absolute. I prefer absolute. Um, you might find that you like percentage better, but here, because I've chosen absolute, I need to set a number, and I'm going to set that at 0.5. Now, whoops, we'll go ahead and set a little larger. Uh, maybe it only needs a three, but I'm putting it at five, exaggerating it just a little bit so that you can see it happen on the screen easier. I'll go ahead and do an apply. Watch the red triangle when I do this. Did you notice that it got a little bit taller? We can actually prove that by selecting the red one and the original blue one, I'm going to come up here and ask that they are center aligned, in other words, exactly on top of each other. Then let's go ahead and zoom in so that you can see. Do you notice how the red extends past the blue? Remember that the red is the one that we fixed with our pull compensation. 
if I take my ruler and I measure from the top of that stitch to the red, we can see that it indeed expanded a 0.5 millimeter, which was the amount we put in. Also, you may remember if I select that again and we go back over here to push pull, notice that the default sets that this is going to change both sides of that object. So we'll go ahead and scoot down here and you can see that indeed it also has added that 0.5 to the bottom. Zooming back out, we change the pull compensation on this first one. With these two, I'll go ahead and choose the orange one, we'll come back up to our properties, do a pull push, but this time I want to change the push compensation. Remember, this is going to be on the opposite sides of the stitch ends, and it's going to help with the bulging. By default, that push wants to push out those sides or expand them, and we want to guard against that happening. So here, we'll change the none to both. My number then becomes available, and I'm going to use the same measurement, that 0.5, go ahead and do an apply. Did you notice on the orange how it contracted? The sides came in. And once again, to prove our point, let's select that one and the blue one, come back up here to my center align, click on that, they now align each other. We will zoom back in and take a look over here at the left. I'm really going to zoom in so that you can see when I do my measurement. And now if I pick my ruler, remember the orange one is the one that was changed. So if I click and drag all the way over to my edge, I can see that yes indeed, that measurement is the 0.5 millimeter that I put in. So it did change exactly as we anticipate when we changed our properties. If I really needed to change the original blue and green rectangles to match the push-pull that was shown in my stitch out, we see again that the height of this one was off about an eighth of an inch, so I would change the pull to be a 0.3 millimeter and the width of this one off by about 1 16th so I would change the push compensation to be a two millimeter. Actually, 1 16th is a 1.58, so rounded that up to about a two millimeter will help with that push pull. So yes, you can go back in. This is the beauty of having a test stitch out. You really can pinpoint any of the distortion that might be happening. We have one more thing to keep in mind when we're talking about this push pull and rectangles and so forth. Let's go ahead and open another design that I have created for us. We take a look at this. It's just really a series of different rectangles that have been abutted to each other differently. The top two, we see that the stitch ends are abutted, whereas the lower two, we see the opposite or the flat sides have been abutted. We would treat these differently if we had two areas like this in a design. We know that on our stitch ends, we need to deal with the pull compensation. Let's go ahead and zoom in a bit so that we can see our stitch ends. Here we have not only a situation where the two stitch ends meet up, we know that the pull compensation is going to cause shrinkage on both of these rectangles, so chances are we're going to end up with a gap here. To change that, let's first select our red, and I'll go ahead and select it through my sequencing. We come over here to our pull push compensation. We'll go ahead and set pull to absolute, and I will try a 0.3 to start with and I'll go ahead and apply. You can see that that did not come over very far. 0.3 millimeter is small. And one of the things we want to keep in mind is the positioning of our needle penetration in abutted objects like this. The overlap should be slightly more than what is required. Too many needle penetrations lining up could perforate or damage the fabric, and certainly it's going to weaken the fabric. So let's come back over here to our absolute, delete that 0.3 and put in a 0.5 and I'll apply that. 
and I like that better that my needle points uh, don't match up as closely as they did. So that will work for this one. Depending on how large of an area this is or the type of fabric that you have, you may even wish to do the same to the green rectangle so that we come under our pull push, change pull to absolute, and uh, I'll go ahead and backspace that out and put in a 0.5 and apply, and now I'll make sure that there is no gap at all. I definitely would want to do a test stitch on this to see if this 0.5 is the proper spacing. Let's scoot down and take a look at these two rectangles that abut each other. Again, the flat sides of these stitched areas are next to each other, so we would want to deal with the push compensation. In other words, remember that this is going to bulge out or push the stitching out over to this side. We want a little bit less stitching here. So let's go ahead and select our red, come into our pull push, come down to push, change that for both sides, and I'll go ahead again and do my three, and I'll take a look to see what that does, if that's okay. I actually want to get a point three, and we'll apply it. And I've given myself just a little bit of area. If I think that's enough, I might leave it, or I could change that to a 0.5. Let's go ahead and change the green rectangle as well. Again, push pull. We come down to push compensation, set that up for both sides, and I'm going to go with my 0.3. If I thought I needed to, again, depending on the design itself, the large area or small area and fabric, I may or may not want to bump that up even more. But here I have changed the top to a pull compensation because of the shrinkage and at the lower rectangles I have adjusted the push compensation because of the bulging or expanding that happens on the sides. Just one more example of how those would work. Let's take a look at another real output. You get a bit of art history in this video because I always like the work of Piet Mondrian. His work may not look familiar to you if not his actual art, as shown here, but maybe you have seen his influence in fashion with color blocking. I thought this would be a good project to test pull push because of all of the abutted rectangles. Hey, if Legos can do it, we certainly can in embroidery. To begin this project, I brought in the artwork using the backdrop tool. I'll go ahead and click on that. Here's my artwork, and I simply moved to create rectangles for each of these areas, including the black, what looks like to be the black outline columns. This was not a good candidate for the magic wand, as it has these slight shadows next to the edges of each rectangles. If we zoom very close into there, you can see the gray shadows. Incidentally, that's the way Mondrian painted them, so that it gave a little bit of realism to what would be a flat painting. When I started, I used the artwork tool, the rectangle tool, and simply did a click and drag for each of the rectangles that were in this particular design. I have it already created for us, so we'll go ahead and bring that to screen. This is what it looked like when I created it. If we turn on the realistic preview, we can see even a better look. I'll go ahead and back this out to be 100% and the design looks pretty nice on that screen. When I stitched it out, however, you see that I had distortion. I have lots of gaps between all of those rectangles in the columnar work of the black. How to fix it? The gaps were about 1 16th, 1 8th of an inch, so I went in and changed each of the rectangles to a pull compensation of a 0.3 millimeter. All rectangles were adjusted individually. Coming back into that design to refresh you just a little on how that would be done, we'll go ahead and zoom in a bit. I selected each rectangle, went into the pull push, turned on the absolute for pull, and put in the measurement that I thought would be appropriate 
for each of those rectangles. And again, I did them separately, went in and made those changes to each and every one. On my next stitch out, you can see that the gaps were better or less and I continued to play with the measurement. You can see that I did a number of stitch outs until I was happy with the result, but this one is the last one, and I actually went in and changed the pull compensation on all of the black rectangles to be a 0.7, and that was the change that I made that gave me my best stitch out. Why pull? Look at the direction of the stitching, it is all vertical, which means the pull is happening vertically. Notice on the stitch out that even though we have gaps, there are none on the vertical black columns because those adjacent columns to the vertical blacks are pushing out on those sides. So when I went in to make the corrections, I did the pull on just the horizontal black lines and it gave me a much better look. Another area that could cause an issue is outlines. As we look at this particular slide, this is a real stitch out. The outlines, this purple circle here and the blue circle here are the outline stitches. Those two circles are the exact same size. It is in the stitching out of these two circles that we see we have a pull push situation here. Actually, it's a push. It's expanding outside of the circle. And if we were to look at just the blue and the yellow, even though we wanted these to be circles, the blue one really is not a perfect circle. Our first instinct might be to fix the outline or the run stitch, but there is no distortion happening to that. The distortion lies within the filled areas. Let's go back into PEP and I'll open up an existing design that I have started for us. And here's the secret to your circles. Once again, the red outline and the purple outline here are the exact same size. It is actually in the drawing of the filled circle that the differences lie. With the blue selected, let me turn on our shape tool and we see that this circle was indeed created with our four equal points with a perfect circle. If we take a look at the red circle and its points, let me zoom in here so you can see a little bit of the difference. When I drew this circle, I did it as an oblong. Even though that gap is very small, by bringing in the top and bottom of the circle to help with push, and extending the sides of the circle out a little bit to help with pull by drawing that circle as an oblong it allowed a perfect circle to be stitched out. That's something that you may or may not have ever noticed before in your stitch outs. Perhaps now knowing what push-pull does and how we might create a perfect circle you might try that. Play around with that and see if that makes a difference in your digitizing. You may already know that different stitch angles add realism or a more dimensional look to your embroidery. The threads catch the light differently and it's just prettier than an area with all of the same directional stitching. The samples here are gold star. Everything is stitched in the same direction. Whereas here in our aqua star, each of the star points has a different direction going on as opposed to the center of the star. And you can see the light on those stitch directions differently. It's prettier. Let's go back to PEP and take a look at another of our free designs. We'll go into library, right click, show contents, maximize that screen, and once again, here, if you take a look right here, this is the path. If you need a reference, this is the path where you go to find these free designs. I'm going to bring up the horses and we'll turn on our realistic preview. Maybe back out just a little bit. so It's not quite so much in our face. And we see that there are a lot of stitch direction or angle going on in this design. The horses are done differently as opposed to the sun, even the mountain ranges have different direction and that's going to make for a more interesting look to our embroidery than if everything was running in the same direction. 
Let's watch the stitch out just to see how the digitizer went about doing it. We see all of the underlay and the different areas and how they're stitched out, uh, the order that they're stitched out, and of course the stitch direction. That is what we're talking about. I've seen questions in the community about why doesn't a shape fill totally from left to right or top to bottom? And now you know why. We've seen a couple different samples with the horse and the circles that we played with earlier. The digitizer has used a pull compensation to avoid distortion. That, along with the position of our stop start, those kinds of things we can control the look of our design even after it's stitched out. So let's go about looking at dividing things into sections. I have a design already started, that star design that we saw. The red one is the original artwork. I simply went under my artwork tool and chose star, created the star, and then copy pasted with the lower two being converted to a fill stitch. Purposely broke up the aqua with a purple middle so that you could see what we're doing here. But I wanted to show you how I went about doing it. So we'll start with our red star. To refresh, we've seen this before in other videos and webinars about the slice tool. We'll go ahead and choose the slice and I simply then clicked and dragged to where I wanted that slice to happen. I'll do a click and drag and a click and drag. I'll do those three first. A right click on my dot, do an update path and I can come up here on the toolbar to break apart and those are separate. I'm left with this middle area. Again, our slice tool and I click and drag where I want that slice to happen and I'll simply take care of those remaining star points. Again, right click on the dot to update path, come up here to toolbar and break apart and now I have that star into six sections. So this is how I went about doing it. I'll switch back over to my sequence view. I went ahead and did right click, convert to complex fill, and then for each of the star points, I took the angle and placed that angle. See that I'm just dragging my black circles so that that angle mimicked the angle of the fat edge of the star. You need to do an apply. Once again, I went into each of those stars and I simply angled according to or matching that inner position and applied and again went ahead and did that for each of my designs. Finished it with the other points and the middle. Let's come take a look at that slide. Again, there's our stars. But when I did my test stitch outs with the first one, you see that we do have gaps. In this first one, I made no pull adjustments at all. Because we did not make adjustments, we have gaps. In the second stitch out, I changed only the star points and made those adjustments to those. I still have a little bit of gap. In this last stitch out, I left all of the points as they were, but I went in and changed the center pull adjustment. And then once stitched out, that came out quite nicely. We'll go back in to our pep, and here's my star. You can see that the points were changed to a point three. And I take a look at each of those, and that's what I've done for the points. And then for the center, when I finally ended up with my last, I went in and I changed that pull to a point seven for that inner star to get that finished look. So again, sometimes a little bit of playing to get the look that you're after. Something else I want to point out, no pun intended, on this particular star are the points themselves. Does this point or any of these three points look different to you than these two points? And here's another trick that you might want to do in a particular design you digitized, and that's to not deal with an exact point maybe you want to round those points off just a bit. And what I'm talking about here, you see them, they're very exact points, and here a little softer. If we look at them close up, you can tell the difference. I actually 
for playing purposes, since I knew this was a practice, I went ahead and rounded my points just a little to see if I like that look better. To do that, here's your star. You have one point. You're going to add two and then delete that one so you get just a bit of a break on the very tip. Let's get a closer look on your design and I'll show you how we did that. We'll zoom in on this particular point. Select this area of the star. Again, there's that exact point. A right click, add that point. A right click, add that point underneath it. I will select this one at the tip and I'll do a delete. And then I simply drag around both of those and I made them align and applied and that's how I rounded off my points. So you can decide the look that you prefer. Sometimes, depending on the size of this design and the fabric used, that point just ends up to be gnarly. So you might want to remember this trick about rounding off your points. Let's take a look at another way that we can help with this pull-push compensation. Back into PEP, and I'll open a design that I have started for us. Bring it to screen. Actually, it's those two circles that we were playing with earlier. And please notice that up here, the stitch count is 3653. Let's come up here to File, down to Click to Stitch. You may have remembered this from previous videos and webinars. First thing we want to do is to change the type of fabric on which we will be stitching. I'll choose Denim. The other options come available for us. We'll go ahead and do a next. It is in this screen. Notice that we have options. I'm going to remove this check mark for density, remove the check mark for underlay, and I'm simply going to ask it to add new pull compensation. Now remember, this is pull, not push, so it's only going to happen on the ends of the stitch points. We'll go ahead and do an apply yes to the question we want to continue and then we do a next you may remember in click to stitch it gives us information about how to go about stitching this particular project we'll do a finish and at this point we do need to name this design so we'll call it click to stitch 2 and I'll save it but please notice up here that the stitch count has been changed to 3660. It was originally 3653. So it added just a few more stitches in that pull compensation. Take a look at that blue circle. Do you remember that it was just exactly on that outline stitch and now it has added it to the outside. We have a little bit more addition to those stitch ends on the outside of that outline of the red circle as well. Pulling up a clean screen, I'm going to briefly mention the idea of pull-push with text. If we create text with our text tool built in, you remember that we create text from fonts that have been individually, the characters themselves have been individually digitized so that when they stitch out, they are all the same size. Let's take a look. I'll type in the word stitch. We'll apply it. It's just in a plain Arial font and it looks very pretty on screen. If I turn on my realistic, I can see that looks very nice. But now let's go in and zoom in on the bottom of this word. The stitches extend past our line of stitching, except on this columnar, but on the ones that are round, and here is what we mean by each individual character in each font has been digitized specifically to have it be the same size when it stitches with its counterparts. And you see it right here. We all know that what we see on screen is not the final look of our stitch out. Here is simply another example of that. In fact, these digitized fonts are a great example of that. If we create our text using our uh, true type text, let me back out here just a little bit, and we would go up to File, Import True Type Text. 
I'll go ahead and type stitch, leave it in Arial and OK it. I am going to change the color of that. And I go ahead and size and fill, convert to complex fill. If I zoom in on that area, you can see that the texts are the same with those letters and you would then have to play with your push-pull because remember this really is just artwork when you create your text from your import true type text. If we take a look at this next slide, we see the letter D. If we measure the width of the column of that D, it's a three millimeter, yet when it stitches out because of the pull on the stitch direction, we can see that it really is only 2.8 width when it's stitched out. So again, in a true type font or fonts that are not digitized, you have to deal with this. In those that are digitized specifically for the software, this happens automatically. It is wider knowing full well that it will be slightly narrower when it stitches out. We saw this slide earlier in the presentation and again it just emphasizes how the push and the pull are taken care of when you do a digitized font. The purpose of this lesson was to give you a better understanding of what pull distortion does to a design and what pull compensation and adjusting push may do to help that design. We know that what we see on screen is not necessarily what we have when the stitching is completed. From your new understanding, you may be able to anticipate where undesirable effects may occur, and you can use the knowledge of push-pull to help fix those problems before they occur. This doesn't mean you should skip the test outs. I wouldn't if I were you. Remember what I found today with my test stitching. You might want to create the example files I used here, just plain rectangles and circles, etc., and stitch them out as created and then as tweaked. Make notes right on your stitch outs. I'm a big fan of learning from playing. Remember too that you won't necessarily have to add pull compensation to everything you create. These particular samples had specifics, outlines, sizes, rectangles that butted up to each other, outlines for circles, and so forth. If you experience puckering, it doesn't mean it's a distortion issue. Puckering is totally different from what we played with today. Puckering could be a hooping issue and any of those things mentioned in that basics for successful embroidery. Think of this new knowledge about pull and push as just another tool in your workshop. Thanks for joining me. Enjoy.